God bless you. Thank you for coming to the house today. Thank you for coming to the house of your father. When the world asks you, what are you doing? You tell them, we are loving our God. Hallelujah. Today I'm going to talk about the clock of conscience, a reflection on repentance. The clock of conscience, a reflection on repentance. And I have two Bible uh, passages, uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, and, Ru- and Luke chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Now we're going to read Romans three twenty-three. It says, for everyone as saint, we all short of God's glorious standard. Luke 13, verses 1 to 5. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all other people from Galilee? Jesus asked, is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too, unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, I tell you again, unless unless you repent, you will perish too. God forbid. Father, we thank you for your word. As we go into your word today, let it bring light, let it bring understanding in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, reflecting on those two passages that we just read, um, there's something, the certain thing that is very clear. Number one, all have sinned. Everyone conceived of a man, born of a woman, is a sinner. That is number one. Number two, there are no classes of sinners. No sinner is better than the other. The adulterer, the fornicator, is not worse sinner than a liar, even if it is white lie. No class. There's no, there are no classes of sinner. Number three, every sinner will perish. Number four, all sinners to be saved must repent and turn to God. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was so definite about it. He was so direct about it. We know that he is love, but he did not mind his word. He said, unless you repent, you all will perish likewise. So everybody must repent. It does not matter the status in in life. Every one of us. Sin is natural to everyone. It comes naturally to everyone that is conceived of man and born of a woman. Just like swimming comes naturally to the fish and flying comes naturally to the bird. So the sin come nat- naturally to every one of us. The moment we could think and act, we began to sin. Have you ever seen a child going to school to learn sin, to learn how to be selfish, to learn how to be dubious, to learn how to tell lies? No, nobody went to school to learn it. It just came naturally. The same way we woke up and we found lies, lines on the palm of our hand. The same way we just found out that sin just came naturally. As a child, you pick a, I mean, a, I mean, a sweet or sugar and that come or mom, it's always mom, say, Junior, did you pick the sweet? No, mom. Yeah, Junior did. But nobody taught Junior. We do, nobody acquired sin 
by the group or by the companion that he or she keeps. Of course, you may grow up to become perfect in it because of your group. You may become a perfect liar, for example, because you have people around you who are good at you know, lying. But that you lie at all when you were born, it's a result of the nature of sin. And that confirms to us that indeed the Bible is true, that man, man fell in the garden and we all came and we got that nature from Adam. And the Lord Jesus Christ says to, all, to you and I, unless you repent, you are going to perish. God forbid in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So it makes it necessary for every one of us to repent. So repentance is not when you see a man when an altar call is made and a man comes out, you don't look at him and say, this guy is evil, he's a sinner. No, every one of us, we must at a point in our life before we die, repent. If, nobody rep if somebody does not repent and he dies in his sin, he is open to judgment. So it's not a matter of, oh, I'm not like him, I'm not like her. You must repent. That is the point. Everyone born of a woman here on earth must at one point repent of that sin. Turn to God and follow Jesus. Otherwise, that person is in the danger of judgment. And you know what that means? It simply means hell. Now, I want to let you know that when a man repents, when you repent, it will show in your action. It will show in your deed. Remember what John said? John said to the, to the, to the Pharisees, he said, you must show the fruit of repentance. He said, who has warned you about the wrath that is about to come? You brood of vipers. Who has warned you? He says, show the fruit of repentance. Show that indeed you have repented. So every one of us, even when we repent, we must show by our deeds that indeed we have repented. Amen. Now, you will see that the Lord Jesus Christ was very direct and very definite with his statement. Luke chapter 13, he said in Luke chapter 13, verse 3, first he said, not at all, uh, unless you repent, you will perish, unless you repent of your sin and turn to God. Then he repeated it again in verse 5. He said, he said, no, I tell you again. Can you see that? It was very definite. Just within how many paragraphs? A sentence, he repeated himself twice. If you look at the Bible, you, you may not find many places where God spoke twice, repeated himself twice. But when he talks twice, he's laying emphasis. Unless you repent of your sin and you turn to God, you will perish. He said it twice. So we have to take that to heart that this is very, very important. And I want to help someone here to understand how important it is to repent. Number one, repentance for, is a requirement for forgiveness of sin. Repentance is a requirement for the repentance of sin leading to salvation. So if you want to enjoy salvation, you must repent. That is number one. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. It says, for godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. You must repent for you to have salvation. I understand, and I'm still going to speak about that. You might have heard some messages saying, oh, it's great, we are saved by grace. You don't even have to repent. The, after all, the robber or the thief that was crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ, they had no time to repent. But Jesus welcomed him into, into his paradise. That is poor or that is bad theology. It is wrong. And I'm going to speak about it and I'm going to explain to you so that you understand. 
Okay. Somebody even said that um, repentance, that salvation cannot be transactional. In other words, you cannot say, oh, God, I do this, you do that. I repent of my sin, you forgive me. He said it's not transactional. He said it's, it's grace. God has, is done on the cross of Calvary. Jesus said it's finished. No, that is wrong theolo theology, and I'm going to speak about it. So repentance, I agree that repentance is not work. It is not work unto salvation, but repentance leads to work. Repentance leads to work. Because tears of repentance... Tears of repentance cannot wash away sin. Only the blood of Jesus does. I understand that. But then, you still going to show the fruit of your repentance. What do you understand by repentance? Repentance actually means a change of mind. A change of belief. You believed this thing before, now you repented. Oh, I'm wrong. And now you believe this. Maybe you've been joking with Jesus Christ before, oh, it's Bible stories, what up? Then you repent, and then you have a change of heart, and now you say, oh, yeah, I believe Jesus Christ is Lord, okay? So there's no way you are going to repent that is not going to show in your behavior, that is not going to show in your attitude, because if you believe something, you'll be acting according to your belief. And now that you have repented, definitely your attitude, your behavior must also show that indeed you have repented, you are not only thinking of that or walking that way, now you are walking straight. So that is why I am saying to you that if you, if you have repented and you look at your actions, you look at your deed, you look at how you dress and you look at how you speak or how you talk, you, see, you look at yourself, you used to be angry and you are still angry, nothing has changed from who you used to be, you need to take a secondary thing, you might have to go back to the feet of Jesus Christ and indeed sincerely repent because your false repentance was not done with a sincere heart. I hope somebody gets that. Good. Now, um, all right. A person that truly repents, we exercise faith. We exercise faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is a new creature, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What is it that has become new? Your way of life has become new. Who you used to be, you are no, long, no longer that person. You have now changed. That is what it means, that if a man is in Christ, if indeed you have repented, you are in Christ Jesus Christ, then you must have a new way. If you sit down and look at yourself the way you've been living previously and nothing has changed, the same way, the same group of friends you've been taking, the same group of people, of friends, you can sit down with them and they begin to um, speak against God, against Jesus. They even make jest of you. Are you the one that killed Jesus? Are you this and that? And you are comfortable sitting among them saying all those things. Something is wrong. It means you have not changed. If they will invite you on a Sunday morning, well, you know you have to be in church, so let us go and play soccer. Let us go and play golf. Let us go and do this. And you agree and say, yeah, let us go. Church can stay. We are go next week Sunday. Something is wrong. Your life has not changed. Your lifestyle has not changed. You've not repented. If somebody, if somebody will say something to you, that you know this person is blaspheming and you do not feel that that is wrong, something is wrong. Or if you tell lies and your conscience does not tell you, oh, no, 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 that is wrong. You shouldn't have done that. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. You need to go back and make sure that you repent. Look at James chapter 2, verse 14 and 17. James 2, verse 14 and 17 he says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but doesn't show it by your action. You said you have faith in Jesus Christ, you are born again, and it does not show in your action. Say, can that faith save anyone, including you? 
Next verse. He says, so you see, faith by itself isn't enough. So it's not enough for you to say, I'm born again. I've repented. And we cannot see it. He says, unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. It's no faith. So I hope somebody is listening to me today. Now, let's take an example of somebody who actually repented. That is a man called Zacchaeus. The man called Zacchaeus was dubious, was a cheat. He took advantage of the people, taking taxes from them, and he was living large. But when he met the Lord Jesus Christ, what did he do? It showed that indeed he repented because everybody that he cheated, that he knew about, he gave them back what he took from them. Let us read the scripture. Luke chapter 19, uh, verse 8. It says, meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, hear me out. I will give half of my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. That is repentance. That is a change of heart. And it showed in his action. So when somebody tells you, oh, Repentance is no work. All you need to do is just repent. You do not have to work on, uh, I mean, on salvation. Salvation is free. It's grace by grace that you are saved. Yes, by grace you are saved. But I'm telling you that what grace does for you is to give you the ability to repent. That is the essence of grace. Because grace, the meaning of grace is power to do something that you would not naturally have done. So as a sinner, for example, you are so used to saying that it will be difficult for you to repent. But when you hear the word and you receive the grace, the grace now enables you to rethink and not to repent. So that is what grace does. So when people tell you, oh, we are saved by grace, you don't have to work at it, there's, nothing, there's no reason for repentance, I tell you again, for the third time, that is bad theology. So, that is what is called repentance. Now, let me talk about the thief that was crucified with the Lord Jesus Christ. Somebody said, after all, that guy lived his life, and while on the cross, he repented. No, not repented. He didn't repent. He had no time to repent. He was already dying. And Jesus Christ said, today, you will be my guest in paradise. So, how can you tell me that repentance is important. I'll tell you this, that man repented. And I'll give you the reason for it. And I'll show you in the scripture. I told you that repentance means guilt. You are guilty and you repent of what you did. Repentance means a change of belief. You believe something and now you have changed. That man knew Jesus. He did not meet Jesus on the cross for the first time because nobody introduced Jesus to him on the cross. He had no time for sermon. Nobody. So that tells me that while he was in the world, still st robbing people and doing all kinds of things, army robbers. I'm sorry, not army robbers. <laughs> okay, pen robbers. <laughs> That was Lazarus. <laughs> that was pen robber. This one is ham robber. <laughs> okay. Now, doing all kinds of things. He must have heard about Jesus. He must have heard about the gospel, but he did not believe. But while on the cross, he said to his second, he said, look, this man is not guilty of the, of the charge for which he was convicted. He said, we, we know that we did wrong and we were entitled to be executed, but not this man. What does that tell you? That is repentance. It's a sign of guilt that the, that man was guilty. He knew it, that he was guilty. So that is the first thing. So he admitted his guilt. And not only that, listen to this. The Lord Jesus Christ, as you know, God in flesh, must have known that that man repented before he would say, today, you will be with me in paradise. He knew that he repented. Now, if he did not repent, and the Lord Jesus Christ says, today, you will be with me in paradise, that tells me that 
all, that would have mean that the Lord Jesus Christ sanctioned his thievery. He sanctioned his crime. Do you get that? If this man did not repent of his sin, and Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise, then it means that he's saying, okay, it's good. It's okay. You're saying, I mean, you, you are a robber, you are a thief, that's okay, but all the same. So, as God, Jesus Christ knew that this man repented, he felt the guilt that he was a sinner and he forgave him. And the same thing goes for every other account that you find in the Bible. Where Jesus Christ says, your sins are forgiven, go your way. A man that was sick, the uh, paralytic that came to Jesus Christ said, your sins are forgiven. And he was healed. Of course, for him to come to Jesus, to agree to come to Jesus, to be prayed for, is because he believed in him, that this man has the power to heal him. Having said that, you cannot take away from what the Lord Jesus Christ himself said in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5. You can't take anything out of it. He says, unless you repent, you are going to perish. He cannot go against himself. So you cannot tell me that the thief that was crucified with him did not repent. And he said, ah, even though I said, unless you repent, you're going to heaven, but all the same, you thief, you are coming to me. You are coming with me to heaven. He will not break his word. That man repented. That is what I'm having you know today. And let me give you another example. If that is not enough, the Lord Jesus Christ told a parable, the parable of the, we call it the prodigal son, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, that parable of the prodigal son was to explain to us what is grace, what is repentance, and what is forgiveness. So, he said, according to the parable, this boy left home with half of his father's um, property estate, he squandered everything, and at the point, the scripture says he came to himself. That means he repent. He says he came to himself and he says, how many of my father's higher servants have bread enough and to spare and I perish in hunger. He said it within, I mean, before going to the father. So that is a conviction. That is a sign of guilt, a sign of repentance. Okay, now the scripture now says that as he approached the father, the father saw him afar and that the father ran to meet him. That is grace. In other words, truly, grace is always available. The father had been waiting for him to return. So grace has always been available. Just the same way that you say, oh, we are saved by grace, not by work. Yes, that grace is always available for everyone that will repent and will come to Jesus. So that is an explanation of what is grace. And the scripture says that now the boy now came to the father. He arose, yes, he arose, and he went to the father. He now confessed and told the father, Father, I have sinned against you, and I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just make me like one of your servants. So not only did Eve find that he was guilty, he went home and spoke spoke and told the father that he had sinned, and the father welcomed him. Now, listen to this. I want you to go and read that account again. The Lord Jesus Christ could have told the parable this way without telling us that the boy said to himself, I have sinned, uh, I will arise, and I will go to my father, and I will tell my father that I have sinned against you, and I have sinned against God. Jesus Christ, our Lord, could have omitted that from the parable. And he could have also have omitted the part that says, as the son got to the father, he told the father, I'm not worthy to be your son, just make me like one of your servants. He could have excluded it. He could have told us that, oh, this guy took half of the father's estate, squandered it, and came back home. And as he was approaching, the father saw him, the father ran to him, kissed him, and welcomed him, and forgave him, and welcomed him home. Would that not have been a complete story? there will have been no reason for him to tell us that the boy felt guilty. 
And the boy said, I will go home. And the boy went home and spoke to the father. It, Jesus Christ was teaching us the place of repentance. That number one, the boy repented, you must repent. The boy would have perished if he had not repented. That is number one. Number two, you must go to God. Remember it says in Luke chapter 3, verse, uh, Luke 13, verse 3 and 5, unless you repent of your sin and, in uh, verse 3, unless you repent of your sin and turn to God. So the boy repented of his sin, turned to the father, went home. That is the place of repentance. And that is the place, now the place of grace. The father saw him, ran to him, welcomed him home. Grace has always been available. And the father said, put on this guy clothing and let us celebrate. My son was lost, now he's found. That is the place of forgiveness. So anytime you listen to a message that says, oh, there's no, no uh, repentance is, is not um, necessary. The thief did not repent. That is bad theology, that is wrong. Unless you repent, you will likewise perish. I'm sure somebody got that point. Amen. Amen. All right. Number two, I want to speak to you today that without repentance, there can never be happiness. Of course, there can be excitement, there can be joy, you can, it may be you are happy and everything is going well for you because you have health, because you have money in the bank. That is not sincere happiness. When those things are not there, how do you feel? Unless you repent, your conscience will be telling you, in case Jesus arrives today, what will happen to me? You will not be comfortable, you will not be happy. And I will give you a quick example. Judas Iscariot, he was, very, he was a happy man. When the disciples sang, he sang with them. When they danced, he danced with them. When they prayed with Jesus, he prayed with them. When Jesus sent them out two by two, they came back with the news. Say, oh, we saw Satan. Um, the power of Satan was subject to us. They came back with the report. He was among them. He was happy. But at the end, what happened? When he returned the money to the uh, chief priests, there was no money, and he found out that vanity upon vanity, all is vanity. He became sad. He could not repent. He could not go to Jesus. So he killed himself and died a sinner. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, without repentance of your sins, you know it. You do not have true happiness. Now, let me now begin to round up. Without repentance... You are not fit for heaven. Well, when I say, when I say rounding up, it's not that I have two minutes to go. <laughs> I'm just saying I'm on the last point. <laughs> All right. Now, without repentance, no one can be fit for heaven. Your heart must be in tune with life in heaven for you to be in heaven. And I will give you. Let me explain to you, to you this way. Let us take for granted, let us say it happens that a sinner made it to heaven. He is going to feel uncomfortable in heaven. Number one, there will be no way for him to lie again because everything is open before God. There's light there. So now it's difficult for him to lie. And it's used to lying. Nothing is kept away from God. So heaven will not be his natural environment. You see it? All the kinds of lyrics that he likes. The rap. Is it, do we call it rap? He won't find it there. The kind of beat that he's used to. It's not in heaven. So it's going to feel strange. What, what, where is this? On whose right is he going to sit? On whose left is he going to sit? 
the saints. He cannot even, he won't even be able to discuss with the saints because the topic that they'll be discussing will be different from what is used to. They are not talking about women. They are not talking about the new week. The, is it the, uh, which one are the Italian week? They are not talking about fashion. So if a sinner should find his way to heaven, he's going to be unfit. Of course, they are singing to God. The scripture says that the angels in heaven, the elders, they sing unto God, holy, holy are thou. They are singing psalms. They are singing praise to God. He's not used to it. He can sing. He can worship. So, heaven is no place for an unrepentant sinner. Do you get it? Have I lost you? Now, let me give you an example. There's a, there's a parable that the Lord Jesus Christ told. Okay? It, it told a parable about a man who was going to have a marriage celebration for his son. So he prepared everything. Everything was prepared. And he invited people. And all of them give excuse. Some said, oh, I've just married. I, I have no time. I've just bought the land. I'm going to see my land. They gave all kinds of excuses. And the man said, oh, okay, angels, go onto the street. Bring everybody. Bring them into the house. And he brought them. And the scripture says, when the king came, he found one of them that did not have a wedding garment. He said, you, you are unfit to be here. Did you get that? Maybe you've read that parable before, but you did not understand what the master was talking about. That heaven is not fit for someone who is not prepared for heaven. So he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And 13 says, then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into the outer darkness. And there will be weeping and, and uh, gnashing of teeth. I just use that to explain to you that you said the, the man, the thief, did not repent. And I'm telling you that unrepentant soul cannot be in heaven. It's going to be straight. It's going to be on feet. Unfit for him. Heaven is a place that is prepared for those who are prepared for heaven. Heaven is a prepared place for people who are prepared for heaven. And I will give you another instance. John and James went to Jesus Christ and said, Lord Jesus, when we get to heaven, can I sit on your right and my brother on your left? And Jesus Christ said, no, I cannot tell you who is going to sit on my right or my left. But one thing I can tell you is that heaven is prepared for those that is prepared for. Maybe you want to look at it. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 23. Matthew 20, 23, so he said, you indeed drink my cup but, and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my Father. Heaven is prepared for those the Holy Spirit has prepared for heaven. Nobody is going to get to heaven by accident. Unless you repent, you will likely perish. So says the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, brothers and sisters, there's only one thing that matters for anyone to get to heaven. That is repentance. Riches does not matter. Health does not matter. Wealth does not matter. Position does not matter. Nothing matters 
other than repentance. And let me tell you, another parable, maybe if we've seen it before, Matthew chapter 19, verse 16. This was a young rich man that came to the Lord Jesus Christ and he told Jesus, Master, what shall I do to enter paradise, the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus Christ responded and said, what does the Bible tell you? He said, oh yeah, it says oh, so, so, and so, so. He said, the Ten Commandments, yes. He said, oh, from my youth, I've always practiced the Ten Commandments. And Jesus Christ said, ah, okay, that's good. I agree. But there's something you need to do now. Go and sell all that you have. Then come and follow me. What was he telling him? Riches does not matter for you to get to heaven. You don't need it. All you need is repentance and following me. Unless you repent of your sins and turn to God, you will likewise perish. So nothing matters. Being married does not matter. Having children or no children does not matter. All those things that we think, oh, these are things that matters on earth, they do not matter for eternal, for eternity. Things that we run after. So that was why he told the man, the rich man, go and sell everything. That is what is keeping you from following me. And it does not matter. Amen. Okay. Now. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. 20, verse 21. And even before I go on, let me just give you an example of people who made heaven. They made heaven, and riches did not matter. Does anybody remember Lazarus? How rich was Lazarus on earth? It was a poor man that was sitting by the gate of the rich man. And the scripture says that he made it to heaven. So that means that riches, wealth, does not matter. The rich man was in hell. It doesn't matter. What of Stephen? Stephen was poor. What of Peter and John? Peter and John said, silver and gold, we have none. But they made it to heaven. What of Jesus Christ himself? The son of man had no place to lay his head. He was poor, he was poor so that we can be rich. But it's in heaven. So all those things does not matter. So when you hear, begin to hear the, uh, the doctrine or the preaching about prosperity and you think that, oh, um, yeah, that means, uh, what is it? God is there because there's prosperity. That... It's not about prosperity. All those things does not matter. If God blesses you, glory be to God. If you are rich, glory be to God. And that is why the Lord Jesus Christ said to those uh, people who came to him to tell him that Pilate killed some people while they were making sacrifices. He said, do you think they are the worst sinners among the Galileans? He said, no. Oh, what about the 12 that the Tower of Siloam fell upon and killed? Do you think they died because they were sinners? He said, no, that is not the point. We've seen people who died young. We've seen people who died old. It does not matter how long anybody lives on earth. What matters is eternity. That is what he's saying. It's eternity. He himself left the earth at the age of 33. Bless God. So Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Apostle Paul says, I have had one message. For Jews and the Greeks alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Unless you repent and turn to God and have faith in Jesus Christ, you will like, likewise perish like those Galileans. Not my word, the scripture. Okay, now... Let me quickly say this. If anyone remains in sin, 
and refuses to repent, that person remains a slave to sin. It remains a slave to sin. Quickly, let us see Acts chapter 8, verse 21 to 23. Acts 8, 21 to 23. Okay. Um, it says, you can have no part in this, for your heart is not right with God. Verse 22. Repent of your wickedness and pray to God. Perhaps he will forgive your evil thoughts. For I can see that you are full of bitter jealousy and you are held captive by sin. Until any man or woman repents of his sin or has sin, that person remains captive. By, by sin. Now, I want to tell you a story. And this will take me about two minutes. And then I will conclude. In my father's house, <laughs> there used to be a clock. That clock hung on the wall in our sitting room. It was a present presented to my mother on her 50th birthday in 1976. And that um, clock was there with the pendulum. During the day, during the hustle and bustle, nobody heard the ticking of that clock. We all went by our businesses. But at night, when everything became calm and we lie down on our bed, then we began to hear the ticking. The same thing is the conscience that is in every man. There's going to be a time that you are going to be alone. And your conscience will be ticking and will be telling you, you have not repented. You are not prepared for heaven. There is danger ahead. You need to repent. When that comes, I pray that whoever has not repented now, we have the time or the consciousness to take the step to repent of that sin. Today, the Holy Spirit is knocking at the wall of your heart. He's telling you, I'm here, I can help you. Let me come in, let me abide with you. I can give you the grace to overcome your sin only if you will accept me. Only if you will confess your sin, only if you will repent and you will surrender to me, I will help you and sin will never have power over you any longer. Will you allow him to come into your life today? Please allow him. Allow him. Allow him. At that time, there will be no pretense any longer. When the time has come to an end, there will be no repentance. There are so many people who are on their bed, on their deathbed, and they became afraid because they do not know what is waiting for them after life. I've shown you by the scripture, by the word of God, I started from the beginning that every one of us sinned. So there's no one that should look at anybody and say that one is a worse sinner than I, is an adulterer, is a fornicator, but I only tell white lies. There's no cause of sin. Every one of us sinned. And we must repent before it's too late. Nobody knows the time except God, not even the angels knows the time, but Jehovah. Jesus Christ is coming back, yes, but the person that died 10 minutes ago, Jesus Christ had come for him. 
So when you say, oh, they said Jesus Christ is coming back, it's been said thousands of years, and it has not come yet. Remember that before God, a thousand years is like a day. He owns time. Time belongs to him. Time belongs to God. Nobody can say when God would arrive. Again, I repeat, the person who just died now five minutes ago, I know that somebody that just gave up the ghost five minutes ago somewhere on planet Earth. I don't know where, but I'm sure that even at this moment, someone is giving his last breath. It means that Jesus Christ has arrived for that person. Will you allow him today? Will you do what is needful, what is necessary? The money, the riches, the wealth. Your wife, your husband, your children. I'm married, I'm single, I'm not married, I'm old, I'm young. Does not matter. It's not necessary for the kingdom of God. It takes only repentance and turning to God for you to make heaven. Here is a chance for you. If you are here today and you have not repented, or you repented, but not sincerely, but today you want to sincerely repent, it does not matter if anybody is looking at you, because every one of us, we are in the same class. So if you rise up, don't be shy. That somebody might be thinking, oh, I'm a sinner. That person that is saying that is a sinner as you as well. Every one of us. So nobody's better than the other. May I ask you to please rise on your feet today. You are here today. You want to repent. You want to declare to God Almighty, rise on your feet. If you've done it before, but it was not sincere about it, I want you to rise on your feet. You don't have to shy about it. God bless you. God bless you. We are all sinners. I'm not better than her. You are not better than her. As a matter of fact, you are worse if you are still seated and you know that you never repented and that you are still in sin. May I tell you this, my brothers and sisters? Jesus is not a savior for a man in sin. He's a savior for the sinner. There's a difference. Jesus is not the savior for a man in sin. He is a savior for a sinner. If you remain in your sin, you are not saved. And if you're online as well, and you're watching the God bless you, and you are watching this, and you want to repent, every one of us, we have to do it one time or the other. Tomorrow might be too late. So I want you also, if you are watching, rise up wherever you are, and I want to pray with you. Father, my Lord and my God, thank you for the message. Thank you for the sincerity of your children. I ask my Lord and my God for anyone rededicating him or herself to you, saying, Lord, yes, I repented before, but I think I did not do it correctly. Now I want to do it with every sincerity. I pray, Lord God Almighty, that you accept and forgive them in the name of Jesus Christ. And for anyone that is doing it for the first time and say, yes, I'm also repenting, oh Lord God Almighty, please forgive. Let the grace be available in the mighty name of Jesus. And now, brother, sister, or whoever, I want you to pray this prayer yourself. Say it yourself. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I confess my sin before you today. I am a sinner. Please forgive all my sins. Wash me clean by the blood and write my name in the book of life. I promise to turn toward you and to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. I rejoice. Glory be to God. God bless you. God bless you. I rejoice with you. That is the best decision that you, are, you can make. Whoever, say, whoever says, oh, look at them. She's a sinner. She's a sinner. That person is a worse sinner than yourself. God bless you. Watch our services online. Visit rccgredemptionhouse.com and click on watch. If you have prayer points and testimonies, write us at share at rccgredemptionhouse.com. 
please send your suggestions, concerns, or questions to pastor at rccgredemptionhouse.com. And that's it for the announcements. Thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of the service.